Just before we start this week, we've been asked to make a statement by the lawyers of the Sean Connery Impersonation Protection Society, um, and that statement reads as follows. Sorry. You'll, you'll see what we mean halfway through. Welcome to the Failing Writers Podcast, where this week, blah, 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 you know the sort of stuff. Yeah, it's just more of that, really. Enjoy. Oh, well, hello, everybody. Hey. How you doing? Uh, you all right? I've got a bit of a cough, John. Yeah, I heard you got, got a bit of a cold, mate. Cold. Oh, I just can't get... Can't get no, well. No, I've... Mr. Can't I've Get the Well, the late thing. edition to the Mr. Men books. Um, yeah, just ever since, since like the end of the summer. It's basically, since uh, my kid went back to school, she just keeps bringing diseases yeah. home yeah. with her. They're basically vermin, like a, aren't they, kids? I think we've said this like before. A, yeah, like yeah. a 16th century rat. <laughs> How are you, Tommy? All right, yeah. Uh, not bad, not bad. Um, plugging, plugging away, losing the will to live and all that business. I think that's what... <laughs> We're meant to be doing this month, isn't it? So that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Well, let's let's so. start by uh, by asking the question: What have we what have we been up to, or what haven't we been up to this week in terms of writing? Uh, Tom, you sound like you've you've got a sad story to tell. Not really. Um, I have oh. been I've been I've started my Nano Um oh, nice. as I said yeah. I would. Good, good. Um, is this with yeah. the with the new idea? Have you changed? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the one yeah. out of the podcast we did. Yeah. Are you are you willing to give us a, a word count? Uh, I can't quite remember what the word count is, but um, it's heading towards ten thousand. Whoa! So that's about good work, wow, Tony. From a, from a late uh, standing good. start. Yeah. Yeah. That's what. I, yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, there we go. Min- minimal back. Yeah. I'm finally starting to get my head around the idea of just writing and not being hypercritical and not going. I'll just yeah. have to stop the whole thing because the character didn't say that in chapter three and I can't be bothered to go and change it's it. It's really hard, isn't it? It's really mm. hard not to think about what you've written once yeah. you've written it. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. To just keep on going. Yeah. And just say, we'll just leave that. I can come back to that. It's I've fine. never managed to do it, to be honest. But I think that's the only way to get through a whole book in a month is to not be concerned about what you've written and just think about what's coming next, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm very much treating it as a, as a this is the planning draft. Because I've kind of, yes. like I said, switched yeah. horses halfway through and I, I've not massively planned this one. Yeah. Just just getting words just getting words out. And I guess that's that's the point of it, isn't it? And that's actually what it's trying to teach you. So maybe mm. I'm learning yeah, something. Exactly. Maybe I'm learning something. <laughs> I definitely need all this time. I definitely need to learn Oh, sorry, I should lesson. add in as well. It is shy. <laughs> um, well, well, I've been writing. But apparently that's not that important at this point. No. Well. So Get it out. Just, we can roll Get with it. Get it down. Yes. We can roll with that. I've read some NaNoWriMo yeah. updates and most of them say basically that it's not your something like it's not your job to write anything good it's just your job to write yeah. something now yeah, that is good which uh takes a bit of pressure off I think have you written anything John uh <laughs> uh no still not written a single word but yeah, and no, I'm excited. I am excited about starting writing. I just, I literally haven't had a chance. Ah. So, uh, but I will. I will. Good. I'll just be a bit later in the day. So, sorry, no news. No well, news. they say that no news is good news, but on this occasion, <laughs> really not, is it? <laughs> no news is <laughs> not meh, indifferent news. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. What about you, David? Uh, still going strong. Yeah. Um, oh, nice. What are we on? 15, 16. 17,000 words ish, I think, something like that. Yeah, it's going up quick, Dave. I know, I'm writing it as I stand here saying these words. So that's like nearly a third of a book you've got smashed out already. I had a moment yesterday where I started to think, hang on, I'm sort of nearly halfway through the plan, but I'm not nearly halfway through the amount of words. And then I started worrying that I hadn't got enough chapters and whether I needed to replan it and add some more chapters in. And then I. Like you, Tom, I had to sort of say, no, don't worry about that. Just, mm. just keep the, yeah, going. Yeah, you just do. You keep have to plodding tell on. yourself off and go, that's not for yeah. now. Yes. You work that's that out later. Draft. Figure that out later on. Um, so, but mm, I did yeah. take a little bit of time out this morning to write uh, a log line in the hope that that would help to keep focused. Oh, I thought, um, you did, I thought you'd done one. No, I'd thought for about the, one. Uh, for the blog. Didn't you do one for the blog that we wrote? No. Oh, oh no. Okay. Ah, no, I, but I just threw some words uh, at a piece of paper. For the blog, <laughs> okay, quickly. that's different. But I yeah, actually, yeah. yeah, did a proper log line. Um, I see. Well I think, done. So I think that's helping to, like, really focus it down and 
and keep it going. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's going well. I'm still enjoying it. You're doing just, well. You're um, enjoying oh, it. That's great news. I'm enjoying it. I am actually <laughs> enjoying it. I keep I keep sort of suddenly having ideas and having to rush upstairs and like write stuff out and yeah, oh, mate. A plan for the day. That's the dream. It is. This is. I keep thinking, why haven't? Why didn't I do this twenty years ago? <laughs> Yeah, but um, but yeah, really, I'm mean, actually enjoying putting words on mm, a page. That's great. Well, so, they, it sounds like the kind of book that people would actually buy. So that's a, you know that's got to be a good thing. Yeah, there's yeah. quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of profanity in it, but I think that's fine. <laughs> that's a good that's, thing. Yeah, 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 they're sort of that's you know, all right. hard as nails, South Yorkshire coppers. They're gonna they're gonna swear every now and then, aren't they? So, yeah, of course yeah. they are. But yeah, all good. Fantastic. Well, on on average, then we're average <laughs> on average we're just below yeah, average do you think you'll actually get it finished then dave in the month is that i think i will get to the end of the plan that i've done yes i think yeah. i will all of the chapters that i've planned out i will get written by the end of the month wow. and that's all anyone can ask for no, really it isn't it yeah, i like the confidence i like the confidence how about yourself tom what do you think how- i think i probably will actually i didn't think so to start off with because i didn't do anything for a week um which, in essence, is, is a quarter of the entire time that's been allocated to <laughs> but it. But you've done a lot in the yeah, last few I days. Before, I find it, if I can actually sit down and do it, I can churn words out pretty quickly. Yeah. I was finding that yesterday when I was writing a, um, what ended up being quite a, a decent chunk of dialogue. And it just it just falls out and it just kind of, it's formed and it just, mm. you know, it's before you know it, it's on the page. Yeah. How loose was your plan? Was it uh, how many like how many pages was your plan? Was it pretty brief? Oh, no, I mean, it, it was next to nothing. Yeah, it was more just a, a couple of beats yeah. rather than rather than any flesh on it mm. really. But that's fine because it gives you something to navigate towards yeah. ish. Yeah, so you're not just rambling. Mm-hmm. A, a lot of it is getting over that psychology of of not worrying that you've mentioned a character in the second chapter that's never come up again. Yeah, that was meant to be your main character's best friend. But it yeah, doesn't matter because yeah. you just get rid of it. Doesn't there. matter. True. Yeah, exactly. Rather, rather than going, oh, I should make them do something else. I'll, I'll go back and change that. That could be some. No, what, what? This is actually great that I'm not doing it as well because I'm learning from you two while you do it. And uh, I'm getting all the top tips, and then come yeah, December, yeah, you'll be like, a, you'll be yeah. streamlined and, and just this is really yeah, good. yeah, which is good because you're gonna have to get it done like in two weeks because yeah. then Christmas starts and yeah. stuff. You're not gonna make yeah, time. yeah. So. Uh, I tell you what, one thing that I did do, like uh, of going back over stuff because uh, I couldn't avoid it after our last chat. I decided to get rid of the name Bobby Brown. Oh, no. no. <laughs> as, as oh, mate. Yeah. It oh, just, he was uh, my favourite. You know, then Michael Jackson? So Bobby. Or... Uh, <laughs> no. Um, Dom. What? Dominic Brown. Dom Brown is good. I Dom like that. Dom Brown's, yeah. Yeah, that is good. So, and he yeah. would be, like, roughly our age, would he, Dom? Um, a bit, I bit younger? Yeah, maybe. Maybe the age that we sort of think we are. <laughs> <laughs> sort of late 30s that kind yeah, of thing yeah somewhere yeah, around that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. nice yeah. <laughs> yes nice. Um, and I just yeah I was sort of I went back because I, I thought actually the fact that I call him Bobby Brown I'm hanging on that as as his character and that's not very good so I gave I changed his name and added a few extra bits to flesh him out as a real person oh and nice so I just went back and chucked a few bits in Brilliant. but apart from that yeah I've, I've been avoiding going back at all just plow on to the end yeah, good work, good work. I've, yeah, I've never managed to do that. I am going to try to do that now. That is very good advice. Hmm. But enough of what we've been writing. What have other people been writing this year? And how have they been getting it out there? Are you talking? Are you just talk, are you talking oh, to yourself again, Dave? We're about to find out. Right? <laughs> I am, yeah. doing that. <laughs> so, yeah, so um, we're about to find out from an actual published author by the name of Tim Glister. John, John, I'm tempted just not to say anything else and just let Dave fumble his way to the end of this segue because <laughs> it's getting fine to Dave. Just keep now. going. How many questions <laughs> he can ask himself and how <laughs> far he can just... Uh... <laughs> well, there is something of a mystery, isn't it? We don't really know what his, what his profession, what his real profession is. I think there's more than meets the eye to Mr. Tim Glister, as, we will, as you will find out as you listen to this interview. But, hang on, chaps. Oh, should I, should I not interrupt? <laughs> no, Carry on. on. 
Her own idiot. Inter- please interrupt. <laughs> I think yeah, please. I think everyone listening That's is just absolutely. saying no, yes, I... interrupt. I'm getting that. Fu- I'm getting that feeling from the audience. <laughs> please interrupt. Someone jump in. <laughs> Hang on. Before we talk. Before we talk to Tim. Um, inspired by our chat with him and and uh, and also the recent buzz about James Bond and stuff. Mm. I've um I've actually written a theme tune for the next <gasps> Bond film. Oh, and I'm hoping that like maybe it'll get used. And that will launch my music career. Because I know a few artists have tried that in the past. Yeah. They'll like write a they'll write a speculative song in the hope that it gets used, you know, yeah. for the next Bond film. Did well for Shirley Bassey. Exactly. So that's what yeah. I've done. And um because there's there's like a there's like a formula, isn't there, to um to bond movie titles. Yeah. I'm sort of pinning my hopes on them, calling the next film Golden Spies Never Die with Love. Because <laughs> if they don't call it that, then my song is less likely to get used. But anyway, uh, yeah. do you want to hear it? Yeah. I'd love to hear it. And after, afterwards, will you, will you tell me honestly what you think my chances are that it yeah. will get chosen yeah. for the yeah. franchise? Yeah, I, I will tell you honestly what your chances are, assuming that they do go with that title. I wrote this to go with silhouettes of And helicopters and Aston Martinis and poker chips and girls who are highly trained at not exposing their naked breasts to the camera and more guns and stuff and men in trunks looking buff because 27 Bond films clearly aren't enough. This is for the next one. Golden spies will never die. With love. I'd say your chances are uh, (laughs) 50-50. I mean, either it will or it won't. So... Okay. In that sense, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's how probability I think that's, works. <laughs> Stephen Hawking said something like that, didn't he? Um, either there are black holes yeah. or there aren't. Uh, I mean, I kind yeah. of, I feel like I've kind of covered all the bases. I think you've, you've hit a lot of touch you know points I mean? in the Bond universe. There, I think. I don't think. Mm. I think they'll struggle not to use it. To be honest, <laughs> yeah. I felt like I could see the opening credits yeah. of the movie. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was going for. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Ladies oh, wrapped in oh, silk. Oh, thanks, guys. Just not quite exposing themselves as oversized poker chips mm-hmm. fall down from the sky. That's it. Yep. You're seeing yep. it. Seeing it. Oh, seeing good. It. I think you should just crack on and write the screenplay <laughs> for it as well. Do, do the full package. Do the full You're package. Right. And then it will be called Golden Spies Never Die with Love. Oh, well, that was lovely, John. Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, we should probably move on now, shouldn't yeah. we? It links in very nicely with our chat with Tim Glister, doesn't it? Because uh, we do talk about James Bond a little bit, don't yep. we? And we ask him, controversial question, who is his favourite James Bond character? So yeah. Yeah. let's find out. Let's talk to Tim. So welcome to the pod, Mr. Tim Glister. Hello, Hello, Tim. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. We always, I mean, we've said it an awful lot if you've listened to any of the podcasts, but um, thanks for being daft enough to come on a podcast called The Failing Writers Podcast. I mean, you approached me shortly after the paperback came out and I was like, oh, okay. That's a short career. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, But no, it's, you know, it it sounded like a really kind of a a fun way of talking about it because I think particularly for, for those of us writers in the, early stages of our career um it's something you're thinking about quite a yeah. lot maybe it doesn't maybe it does but um your first book seems to have been quite a success quite well received yeah so um so red corona uh yeah. the name of the novel the best titled novel of the year <laughs> and and i think that that partly goes into into part of the thinking about kind of what it's like to be a debut writer because i'm in i'm in a relatively unique position with my novel um a lot of people obviously went through that kind of 2020 experience yeah, of having yeah, things yeah 
pushed and and changed um, or delayed. We had we had a particularly big issue that we needed to grapple with on our on our road to publication. Yeah. yeah. So what? So what came first then? Well, the the novel. Uh, well, the, actually, the novel used to be when I first wrote it was just called Corona. <laughs> right. It's, it's it's inspired by the American Corona satellite program. The novel itself is is a blend of fiction set in a factual environment. So it's it's the story of Richard Knox, who is an MI5 agent who is kind of on his uppers um, and believes that his way back into the service and its good graces is to uncover a mole working at the highest level of the security service. And as he's doing this, the American Corona satellite program is also being developed and launched. And this is this kind of fantastical, almost sci-fi, almost Bond-esque piece of global surveillance technology that was being launched in the early 60s. That was where the inspiration for the novel came from, really, when I discovered the Corona satellite. And then I kind of built the narrative in my head over the years, got it all kind of like squared away, went, went through my kind of journey to finding an agent, finding a publisher, uh, getting a pub date, getting a jacket. And then obviously we, we hit spring 2020. <laughs> yes. And as I like to say, this, this funny word um, <laughs> that, that was, you know, felt a little bit Icarus, a little bit Odessa, uh, suddenly took on a completely new meaning. Yeah, yeah, it did a little bit. Yeah. Was there, you know, the whole, because that sounds like a completely classic sort of spy, espionage sort of thing. Has that been, was that you growing up in terms of the stuff you were reading and like getting excited about? Were you a, a massive James Bond fan? What was the... Yeah, I was, I was a huge James Bond fan um, growing up. I mean, the really flippant joke I say is that I kind of ran out of Bond novels to read, so I just wrote one. <laughs> Um, but you know those those Bond novels those Len Dayton novels um, Ken Follett Frederick Forsyth all those um, people I grew up reading and and watching Um, who's your favorite James Bond Tim uh see now I've if you read my Twitter at the moment it sounds like I'm coming out very strongly in favor of Daniel Craig um, interesting yeah well i think my my reasoning at the moment for liking daniel craig's bond is that to my mind he's the closest bond to the bond of the book yeah. right right um because we, are, we we went through this character trajectory of kind of him turning a bit dark and hard and cruel and um malevolent because of everything that was going on around him that said the obvious answer is actually sean connery right <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know you you're not you're not yeah. going to do much better than Russia with love and Goldfinger, really. Yeah. Am I weird? Because I, I actually really like Timothy oh, Dalton. I think you I, are I like weird, Tom. Tom, but I don't think it's because you like <laughs> well, Timothy not because Dalton of necessarily. Yeah. Just out of interest, yeah. Tom, have you rewatched them? Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, don't do not do that because <laughs> it will ruin them forever. Why Why have they, have they not dated <laughs> yeah. in what sense? In the no. misogynistic <laughs> no. way or special effects or <laughs> yeah. all of Just the sort above? of everything, yeah. really. Yeah. 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 Just yeah. everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny how things change, isn't it, where it's, yeah. it's no longer... PC gone mad, isn't it? It really is the woke society we live in, where it's no longer okay for a for a spy just to walk into a lady's shower and announce. <laughs> the way the world has changed, yeah, it's crazy. The things you just can't do anymore. Oh, <laughs> terrible, terrible. Although I feel yeah. like didn't uh, Daniel Craig do that in a recent film? I'm sure he. You know that Angelina Jolie does it to him in uh, yeah. the Tomb Raider film. Oh, there you go. Then I mean that is one of, that Tomb Raider is one of my favourite Bond films. So that's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that's literally uh, that's tit for tat. <laughs> <laughs> I do go quite kind of, I, I'm very broad in my kind of reading and watching taste. So yeah, I'll 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 take on everything from Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy or the Night Manager right through to yeah, yeah. you know Tomb Raider or even the Red series, oh, yes. which I think are kind of like a, a super fun. Guilty, guilty pleasure. Old people can be spies too. Um, yes. <laughs> a couple of, couple of films. So I'm, I'm guessing it was the reading of those books that kind of made you feel like you were qualified to write a spy novel. Because I was thinking, you know, you've you obviously you spent your career, uh, I think, mostly working in advertising and as a literary agent. But the the leap to a to writing spy novels seemed quite big. And there was a period where I was thinking, well. You're clearly just a spy, aren't you? <laughs> um, 
And, and this, to be honest, <laughs> Tim, this is a this this is an opportunity for you to just admit it, just come out and just say, you know, because um, it just it just doesn't wash for me the whole. Well, my my, uh, working in my theory thing. has always been that the best cover for being a spy is telling people you're a spy because it's so. Oh, he's doubled. He's gone double down <laughs> on us now, and it hurts my head. <laughs> so yeah, I told you he was clever. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you do you, do you own a Macintosh coat? I do. And I, and I may have bought it in East Berlin. <laughs> Come on, Tim, now. Okay, well, that, There's dropping clues. That, uh, actually, I think I, that actually, clears it up. The funny that thing about that is up. I didn't buy it in East Berlin. I got someone else to buy it in East Berlin, carry it across <laughs> the border, and then give it to me. Oh, so it couldn't be traced. Things you learn, isn't it? The trade. Yeah. It's the well, trade. I just didn't have room in my luggage for it, really. So was this was this novel bouncing around your head for years and years then? Was it, was it the classic first novel of been in your head for ages it, it had i'd actually started so when i when i left publishing um and moved into advertising i started well, I, I did a uh, i did one of those guardian weekend courses in script writing all oh, right yeah because uh, i thought I'm, i might need to write radio ads or tv ads and i don't know how to write dialogue so i started doing that and from that i started writing a few scripts in my spare time and they all kind of had a little bit of a a spy or a thriller or a kind of puzzle element. Are these screenplays? Or, oh, so this or was screenplays. Right. So I started doing that and I wrote a couple. They did, you know, they did okay in those kind of screenplay mm. competitions. Mm. And then I always had something about the Corona satellite ticking away in the back of my head. And then when I started to kind of knit a story together, it was the first one that I come up with that I thought, I think this needs more building, more development more work more words effectively um, yeah. than i could get in a script or at least if i was going to end up writing a script i'd need to write the novel <laughs> first and that's so that's that's where it finally came from um i did have to overcome quite a bit of nerves because i i'd worked for the agency that represented charles cumming and henry porter and uh ellie griffiths and you know kind of the current like titans of of English fiction mm. um so for me to kind of have the gall to write something myself <laughs> took a bit of effort and and involved keeping it secret for most yeah. of the time that I was doing it yeah the the uh, the whole idea of the corona I mean it's such a gift isn't it it's the I always think of that that period in the 60s being a sort of heyday for espionage stories the 50s and 60s you've got the cold war and the space race can you kind of set the scene for us? Yes. For the story? So um, the Corona satellite w will kick off with that was developed by NASA and the CIA in the late 50s. It was the first ever attempt to create something that could give a superpower kind of full global um, surveillance coverage. So this isn't the mm. Stasi. This isn't kind of human intelligence, people on the street. It's technology. Yeah. It was the most advanced thing that had been created for that purpose on the planet. However, because it was still the late 50s, early 60s, um, there were kind of interesting technological limitations, we'd say now. <laughs> uh, mm. <laughs> the prime one being that we hadn't worked out how to... Um, pierce the earth's atmosphere mm. with heavy data signals we didn't we didn't have digital communications at that point we were just mm. using radio waves and that meant that the satellites would blast off up into orbit sometimes they would make it quite often they exploded um <laughs> and the satellites would be positioned over whatever target you wanted to take a photo of it would then take a photo of it a very high resolution photo but the photo was on film real and it what, would mm. then send it to jessup's to get it developed effectively <laughs> effectively what the, what they had to do was then put this roll of film in a little canister drop it out the back of the satellite <laughs> have it parachute down over the pacific um and then send a giant hercules transport plane um with a big hook hanging out the back of its cargo bay door to try and grab it <laughs> to try and grab it out of the air it is like a it. needle in a haystack image, isn't it? Finding a roll of film in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like if you were the guy at the CIA who had that idea, the people around the table would just laugh <laughs> and then carry on with their day. <laughs> yeah. And also what, what's fascinating about it is that, and this is something that kind of goes in the book, but also just about kind of the, the history of the technology, is the next step change 
comes quite soon after. Yeah. yeah. But, and this is on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the Corona satellites were still used by America into the 70s and the Soviets had their own version, uh, the Zenit satellite, which obviously was kind of bulkier and more Soviet looking. <laughs> um, and they used that right up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. So wow. as kind of incredible and silly as the technology might appear once they got it working yeah yeah it works it's weird isn't it because i think these days we sort of take it for granted that governments can just spy on us relatively easy you know you've got spy satellites and cctv everywhere and facial recognition cameras and drones and stuff but that uh, the corona program sort of represented a big shift in surveillance didn't it yeah and i think what, what i talk about is kind of being where the world we live in now began yeah 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 yeah. and that's that's one of the reasons i wanted to to set the story back then because there's a version of this novel that could happen now yeah but it would just be people sat in front of computers yeah yeah Yeah. that would be a bit less exciting yeah (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, it does it does make you wonder doesn't it when they when they invented this satellite whether uh, anyone you know any of the big big brains working on it did kind of say you know in, in 50 years you'll just be able to view this on your on your television device just to see where the fish and chip shop is or to get directions. <laughs> yeah, it will, yeah, it will become equal parts utterly terrifying and fantastically mundane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it it's funny crazy. though, it's interesting about the, uh, um, whilst we were sort of researching you for this, I was thinking about the amount of research that, that you can do into a, a book like this. Is it quite hard uh, to sort of research certain areas of something that's as secretive as spying? Um, some of it is... Not for a spy like Tim, Dave. It... <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> <laughs> really easy. I mean, what is, what is interesting is working out how you balance the, the completely made up side with enough real world information that's blended together so the whole thing yeah, feels yeah. true. You know, I, I found that even reading like Le Carre, I, for years in, that, in my younger self, before I, before I delved into the details of what he'd created, had completely taken for granted that things like where he put the circus was, you know, a, a, was a part of the British intelligence apparatus. <laughs> what he, you know, what he used in place of the, the Lubyanka and KGB in, Russia again I just assumed that was real because he wrote it in a way that made me completely believe it yeah. I, I wonder with because when you have people who write police procedurals or you know murder mysteries that kind of thing they often work with so like a former police officer or whatever to to check if things are right that they're writing I, is it can you do something like that when you're right you know can you ring up a spy and say oh, look did you have a watch that could blow stuff up or just like yeah. is this does this work? I mean, some, sometimes you can. Um, you know, there, there are people you might be able to talk to. I, I was lucky enough that for some of the kind of the real world details, I was able to kind of just talk to family members. The other spies in your um, family, yeah. <laughs> oh the other spies God. in my family. <laughs> I think we've unearthed the whole network of spies here, lad. <laughs> I mean, there are some stories that my father tells about his about his life in London in the sixties, which definitely make me question what he was actually. Doing. <laughs> but uh, but you know, it, it's that kind of exposure that I've been able to pull on. It's funny you talk about police procedurals, actually, because I'm one of those people that always kind of avoids writing about police if I can, because I <laughs> just don't have that wealth of knowledge about yeah. how you know, how kind of like the chain of evidence. Yeah, um, no, no, absolutely. You know, you, all, of, you, all of those things. You start writing something, don't you, about it? And then you realise, you think, oh my God, the only, I only know this from, from like watching TV and stuff. Yeah. And, it, um, and, the, and the bill wasn't a documentary. So actually some of this <laughs> might not be, might not be right. And yeah. you do feel a bit exposed, don't you, when you're writing stuff like that? You kind of, because people do pick up on yeah. it. Yeah, but then I, I was in, um, I was at Harrogate this year listening to a, a police procedurals panel that I thought I'd go and kind of like try and face my fears. Um, and half of the people on the panel were saying, you know, I work very closely with the police to make sure all my details are right. Uh, and the other half were saying, like, the details aren't important. It's stories yeah. about people. Because ultimately, it's, it's only the police officers reading it who 
care presumably to a certain extent yeah and i think i think as long as you know as long as you tell you know as long as you tell a story that isn't kind of contradictory within itself yeah mm. you know then then it's reasonable I, I used to say a long time when i when i was agenting and i used to give kind of occasional talks to creative writing students mm. i always said like you can set you can set your story wherever you want you know it can be on a it can be on a spaceship i just need mm. to believe that it can fly yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I pres- su- yeah presumably people don't really watch bond because of its hyper realism <laughs> do they that's not the of what draws you in but, yeah. that's what born's for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no what i was just going to say about you know um our only experiences is sort of watching spy thrillers and reading the books and it always seems that for all the sort of different training and techniques and gizmos uh that they have the success of most operations seems to at some point it always hinges on luck so how do you make sure mm. that your sort of plot devices remain uh, credulous i suppose so i'm definitely a plot first writer yeah and i think that particularly is true in well, it could be it could be any kind of genre fiction but but the genre fiction that that is almost you know you've, you've set up a problem that you have to solve um so you kind of have to know how to solve it in fact the, the very first ever piece of writing advice i got was from a script writer who said know your ending yeah mm. and that's one that's a lesson i've always always taken to heart i don't think it's always the case with every form of storytelling i think there are you know if we if you're looking at the more literary yeah. end or the less kind of you know puzzle or crime and solution based novel it is easier to kind of create these characters and then see where they take you and go along for the ride with them because that's the yeah. fun of that story um but for me it's certainly you know making sure that i have you, know, you 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 draw the straightest line of your plot as you can and then you start to kind of overlay the red herrings mm. yeah. and the additional plots and the things that might be important but then fade and then do that so it feels structurally like it would be entertaining enough and those those red herrings are really important because again my experience working in in publishing was you know, being wary of things that that require or hinge on a big yeah. twist mm. that hasn't been signposted. You know, your signposting can be subtle, but it needs to yeah, be yeah. there. You can't just have it be be a, you know a, a reveal at the end that had nothing yeah. to do with yeah. the rest yeah. of the novel. Um, but once I've done that, then kind of the the skill that I'm still learning and enjoying learning is saying, okay, how do I make it so that my characters are motivated to do these things rather than just that they need yeah, to have done yeah, it by yeah. page 50. Um, and that that's really fun because that's when the characters start to come alive in my head rather than just being kind of like, oh, well, this is the plot device that's running the third yeah. narrative strand. Suddenly it's like, oh, actually, this character has hopes and feelings and ambitions and frustrations. Mm. So this is why mm. he's doing these um, things. Completely unrelated to all of that, I've got a question that, that popped up in my head. Um, so you know James Bond? Uh, and we're saying about how things are resolved on a bit of luck or something like that. You know, in, in a James Bond film, he always ends up going to like a banquet or a, an evening event in a large house that's often hosted by the what we find out is the major criminal at the end. Why does he always, when he hands his coat over at the door, he always tells him he's James Bond? <laughs> well, also, you know, in, in this day and age, because Bond is modern. It's like when he walks into a room full of his greatest enemies, it's like, they know who he is. <laughs> yeah, surely they've <laughs> seen the films, haven't they? They must know by yeah. now. <laughs> the, only, the only advantage he's got is when he changes from one Bond to another. That'll, <laughs> that'll really fool them, won't it? Yeah. <laughs> They're looking out yeah. for Roger Moore and Sean Connery turns up. You're listening to the Failing Writers Podcast which guarantees to always leave you shaken and not stirred into action. Do you get it? Stirred into action to actually write something. It's a clever play on words. Super. Carry on as you were. It's not going to get any better. But the other thing about the sort of uh, the spy genre, uh, probably more than most others, is the amount of sort of pastiches there are and, and sort of spy parodies. So with all that sort of stuff going on, how do you go about sort of avoiding cliches? Um, it is a challenge. And there are moments where you think, oh, that's actually just too easy. 
uh, or that's too yeah. obvious. But then sometimes mm. you write yourself into a corner and you're like, well, actually, this, the only solution yeah. is this. There's a reason tropes are tropes is because they're kind of satisfying and quite cool. Yeah. Uh, you know, but what I, what I can do is kind of at least mm. acknowledge that. You know, I, I don't yeah. like people that kind of, you know, when, when they learn something that an awful lot of people already knew, present it as like, oh, look <laughs> at this incredible plot I've invented. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was that person that would watch kind of... A, some of Black Mirror and be like, well, I can tell you the nine Star Trek episodes <laughs> that did this twenty years ago. So, but I think that I think that there's 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 quite a fun way of addressing some of those things by kind of fessing up. Like there's a there's a there's certainly a bit in Red Corona where I I actually kind of refer to a character coming back into the plot kind of almost as a Deus yeah, Ex Machina, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's like, well, yeah, he is for the purposes of that scene. You know, I'll write a good scene around it, and it will be enjoyable. Mm. But yes, he is he is acting as a Deus Ex Machina. <laughs> so that that's your first book, Tim. You, you've got uh, another one. What is it? Blue. I don't know. Ebola. Blue Ebola. <laughs> yeah. what, what, what we're going with for this one? We uh, did. Take that into consideration. <laughs> <laughs> yes, second one. Don't, nothing that might happen that we don't know about. Uh, yeah, what, what's uh, what's on the cards for the second book? Uh, yeah, so a loyal traitor. Uh, Ooh, nice title. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It felt kind of quite Le Carre. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that is a great title. I was quite, I was quite pleased with it. I mean, of course, we'll now wait for you know Boris Johnson to sell the nuclear codes <laughs> to someone yeah. um, and make it come true. Uh, Did, was that was that uh, one of those? that title just jump out of you has that been the working title or was that a hard fought uh title? that was no that came quite late i i had right, a okay. title that was that was different it was called double star um right which if i explain the cosmological phenomenon it makes sense but it also wasn't actually in the book um, so, so it didn't really didn't really <laughs> yeah. deserve to be the title and then i started to think about kind of like what what is the true essence yeah of yeah 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 story um and that's where i got to to a loyal traitor i sent it in with a couple of other options to to my publisher and they said like that's the one that kind that's of the sales one. marketing the rest kind of really latched on and the yeah. jacket designer as well because it's it's stunning what they've been able to do with the um with the jacket for it um right, brilliant. But the the story um it's a sequel so it's richard knox again right okay, okay. Uh, we've moved forward into the the kind of the 60s outright so Red Corona is set in 1961, which is a period that's kind of both the 60s and the 50s, yes, really, because yeah, it's, yeah. it's on that cusp of a, of a decade change. A lot of traitor moves us forward to spring 1966, um, two weeks before the World Cup. So I didn't have to write about that because I wasn't sure how I could make it relevant <laughs> <laughs> to a spy novel. The um, TV was switched the, off. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and what it does is is it revisits Knox and a couple of the other characters from Red Corona um, in this period where the Cold War has kind of become a war of attrition. All of these cold warriors and spies who were incredibly patriotic and ambitious and understood what they were fighting for in 1961 are now five years down the line and nothing really has yeah. changed mm. so they're starting to question their kind of their role and what what they're achieving and what i then introduce is a kind of a bigger more personal cause for Knox to to grapple with and look at how that pulls him between his you know his his duty to his country and his honor to his friends mm. And what stage? What stage are you at with that book? That's completely finished, or you... that's completely finished. Uh, we got bound proofs last week, uh, which is really exciting. It comes out February the tenth in hardback. Great. And I'm currently actually uh, starting to crack on with book three. Oh, wonderful! So, can you tell us a bit about the actual writing of the book, Tim? Like the process? Sorry, of uh, Red Corona. Uh, because I'm yeah. guessing you were, were you working at the same time or did you give up work and then start oh, right. writing? Uh, no, <laughs> uh, no I, I, still work, I still work full time. Um, Red Corona was very much a, to begin with, an evening and weekends secret project. You know, I'd wake up early on a Sunday so my housemates didn't know right. that kind of thing, take myself off to a cafe. It was handwritten to begin oh, well. with and then typed up which i told myself was a way of kind of giving myself a little secret extra edit <laughs> yeah, yeah. So by yeah. the time i was actually typing it up i was kind of rereading a paragraph and going yeah. like no that's a bit yeah. clunky you know let me fix that or i've used that word a page earlier so first um the first draft how long did that take you? uh that was oh, about eight months right 
and as as I said, I it's one of the things that that freaks me out now being an author active on social media is where you see all these writers who have what seems like all the time in the world and they blow through a first draft in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. <laughs> and I'm like, sometimes I, I, sometimes I can't write anything Bastard. a week because of work and life. <laughs> you know, mm. sometimes I'll have a great month where I can write 10,000 words and that seems like an incredible yeah, thing. It takes me a week to write a shopping list. <laughs> so it's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. And I think what part of, part of the thing I learned over the course of it was not to be too stressed about that. Yeah. You know, just writing, writing when you can. Um, one of the good things was my day job, which is, is in advertising, and I'm primarily a copywriter by trade. It's that I don't kind of get the luxury of writer's block or sitting in my feelings too much because yeah, you know, on a Wednesday I might not want to do something, but I still have to do it because yeah, a client's yeah. pen. So you're quite well disciplined. Yeah, and I can apply that mentality mentality to myself. Mm. Remember, if you're enjoying the podcast, I mean, even if you're just barely tolerating it, please recommend it to your friends. So after that point, Tim, so you finished writing the book. Um, how long from that point to getting it published? What was the what was the journey after that? Uh, so wrote the book, uh, was lucky enough to get interest from my agent, Gordon Wise, at Curtis Brown, who's you know, a powerhouse working for a powerhouse he helped me with you know with again a fresh round of editing and polishing we then went out to publishers ended up with uh, point blank which is the the crime and thriller imprint at one world they're a fantastic kind of independent publisher that does really interesting things so i was really really mm. excited to to get to work with them again there was there was some editing uh, after that point the funny thing is obviously you whenever you write a novel you always get to that point where it's like, this is it. This is the best version it can be. Uh, I'm done until about three days later when something occurs to you. Yeah. So by the time I was getting to have editorial conversations about it with my editor, I already had a list of things that I knew I wanted to make better about it. And they aligned yeah. with her list, which was fantastic. We were then all set to publish start of May 2020. Again, you know, it's a it's a novel that has modern resonances about Britain's place in the world. It's a novel that has mm. modern resonances about kind of the abuse of personal data. Um, it was an American election year. Uh, we we it was going to be released directly halfway between the Black Widow movie and No Time to Die. Right. It all felt like it was lining up quite nicely. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And then so that's just what you did. You just did that, then, did you? That's what you went and had and did. There's nothing else. Yeah, going no, that was it. Yeah, that was following it. that. Perfect. <laughs> you know, and then and then of course, kind of the world stopped. Um, yeah. And yeah. we had some very difficult conversations, in large part because we'd already printed the book, so suddenly the idea of kind of right. rejacketing it and changing the name became an expense when publishing didn't know yeah, if, yeah. if its market or its business model would survive the year. We thought we were being quite clever by just waiting until January, have a good slot in January to release it uh, in our back. Of course, we then ended up getting the surprise January lockdown. <laughs> yeah, um, the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah, so the hardback was was released into a January lockdown uh, where all shops were closed. And then the paperback <laughs> was released in September in the middle of a uh, global supply chain crisis and paper <laughs> shortage. And then I got a request from a podcast about failing writers. Uh, it's a slippy... <laughs> uh, <laughs> asking me if I wanted yeah. to be involved. The good thing is, though, Tim, once you've hit rock bottom, then <laughs> <laughs> it's all... It's all up from this point in. <laughs> uh, but I do actually, I do have to say that again, if that's, that's a, it's an entertaining and slightly navel gazing version of the story. What's been wonderful is how much the industry and the kind of the writing and reading community has embraced kind of not only just helping people out at the start of their careers, but coming up with you know, different podcasts from different angles or online festivals and events and that kind of transition and yeah. into the digital realm that meant that i've actually been able to do stuff that i probably wouldn't have been able yeah, to yeah. do in a normal situation yeah. yeah um so it's you know it's in a in a weird way you know when you're looking to to write a series kind of the really important thing right at the beginning is building those strong bits of foundation um and i'm getting to do that um you know i'm mm. getting it i'm getting kind of some lovely reviews from kind of mm. important people 
also some wonderful kind of responses from people that say i would never normally have read this kind of book but i yes, know yeah, yeah, yeah. i loved it which is yeah, really yeah you've got nice. some amazing reviews and That's then being true. able to do things like online festivals mm. and events um and podcasts with you guys and blog pieces and you know stuff like that just so that you know again when when you google me you start to find more <laughs> stuff that sounds like a happy ending doesn't it it does but sorry, just going back a little bit. Speaking of that, googling you, I did. I did see that you worked with Cambridge Analytica for a spell, oh, yeah. and I suspect you've signed a fairly hefty NDA. But did that experience give you any sort of insight into like how the corridors of power operate and the and the way that politics can get quite tasty? Did it Did it yes. sort of feed into the book in any way? Yeah. So I was. I worked with. Well, I I was hired by a company called SCL in 2014 they just said they were you know a political communications agency mm. like cool i've worked in tech i've worked in publishing i've never worked in politics it'll be something you know interesting to add to my cv for a bit mm. um the same way that i now kind of work in financial um advertising i like knowing how things work and mm. what's going on behind yeah. the scenes yeah um so that always draws me to to any of my jobs and also probably explains why i write what i write SEL, after a couple of months of me working there, then kind of started to become Cambridge Analytica. And it was fascinating to, to see it change and grow and shift from this company that was kind of on the marketing side, almost exclusively staffed by kind of wide-eyed, centrist political science graduates mm. uh, and me. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, then it kind of embrace this kind of really strong, dark, right wing edge, um, mm. which meant that kind of everyone on the marketing side left over the course of a few months. Uh, when we all saw, was that, did that kind of come from the top? Was that a sort of leadership thing? Yeah, it was where they saw the money coming from. Yeah, yeah. You know, there was, there was always an attitude that they didn't mess with British politics, but everything else was kind of a game, and it really did feel like to them it was all a game. Mm. Um, wow. what was then interesting was kind of three years down the line to see the, the kind of the expose in 2018, mm. you're like, God, I'm sure I remember being in meetings when they said we'd never do anything about Brexit. And then you suddenly, <laughs> yeah. and then you suddenly yeah. find out that they were like all in, <laughs> mm. uh, but that, you know, that, that kind of, you know, use, abuse, fear of what can be done with, with a person's data. Um, mm. definitely yeah. kind of informed Red Corona. But again, I wanted to kind of go back to telling that story. I also felt like I couldn't really tell a Cambridge Analytica story outright because, yeah. I mean, to your point, yeah, you'd think that it may be signed an NDA. Um, but when I was working with them, they were so charmingly useless <laughs> at everything they did. That was almost why everyone was kind of happy to work there because we were taking someone's money but doing nothing of any consequence. <laughs> Yeah. And then when you started to see them kind of get their acts together, that was when we all kind of realized it might be time to <laughs> move yeah. on. No, it's fascinating. Yeah, very, very odd period yeah, in my life, but I think yeah, it definitely. It's definitely informed my writing yeah. perspective. I just got one more question to ask you. I, I actually haven't read that many uh, spy novels. I've read a couple of Le Carre's, which I really enjoyed, to be fair. But do you do you have a favorite spy novel? If you were to recommend one to kind of get you into it, what would it be? So I... I mean the the easiest right now it is very good. Don't say red corona, don't say red corona. Red corona. corona. Oh no Uh, Tim. Um I'm just looking at my looking at my bookshelf and I'm trying to think. I am gonna give you three recommendations. Oh yeah. And I would say Spy Who Came In From the Cold by John Le Carre is the prototype kind of grizzled real Mm. world bleak, but so clever. You, you have to keep reading its spy novel. I think it might be his shortest novel. It's certainly his, the easiest one that I've been able to kind of wrap, wrap, wrap my head around because he is very cerebral sometimes. On the Bond side, because there has to be one, um, it has to be from Rush With Love. You know, a Bond novel where Bond's not even in it for about 80 pages is a fantastic, you know, achievement to, to tell that story, to give those extra perspectives. And it's, and, you know, and it's a, it's a classic Bond novel, so it's just entertaining um, and carries you along. Uh, and then the other one I'd suggest would be Our Man in Havana by Graham Greene, because it combines both of the things that make Le Carre and Fleming mm. great with those two books, and then just adds this fantastic layer of satire on top of it. It's just 
look, it's a it's a clever spy novel in its own right. It's indictment of society at the time in its own right. It's also just so witty Brilliant. as well. Great recommendations. That's something to get into. There you go, Tom. Something to read. T- in terms of films, you say you say Austin Powers and Johnny English. <laughs> yeah? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Cool. <laughs> cool. You take the books, lads. I'll take the films. Um, but yeah, thanks ever so much for coming on. Good luck with the second book. Oh, my, thank and you. It so sounds much. like you've even got a third in the in the brain. There is that. Like you said, you're starting to work on the third already. Starting to work on it. Yep. Uh, not going to say how far I'm through because there's a deadline uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> that I don't want to get stuck to. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's it should be fun. I'm really excited about writing it. I'm really really kind of relieved that that three in. I'm still enthusiastic yeah yeah it's right. still got legs and it's still and this is another yeah. Knox book brilliant or can you this, yeah this will be this will be another Knox a slightly shorter uh, leap in time this time just moving to 1967 uh, but again with a with quite a major global political event as the backdrop and then Knox kind of working his way behind the scenes thank you very much for coming on and talking my pleasure to thanks for having me uh, cheers Tim see you later cheers, um, bye Brilliant. Well, that was Tim Glister. Um, we'll put a link to his book, Red Corona, in the uh, in the show notes as well. Yep. So if you fancy a, a riveting 1960s spy novel, that would be a good one to choose, I think. It's got very, very good yeah. reviews. Buy it now before it's classified. Do you know what I thought was interesting, what he was saying about... Um, that it's set in 1961 and he said Mm. that's kind of like it's still the 1950s and the 60s because he was saying about his sequel being set later in the 60s and that was the 60s in 1960 60s and i was thinking that's so true of decades isn't it how we kind of put them in this slot of like the 80s the 90s yeah but there is that weird overlapping in between a bit in each one in each little era where you don't realise until you're out the other side that there's like a weird... Yeah. yeah. You know, that change. weird melting point of the 80s and 90s Yeah, where there were shell suits, which were very <laughs> 90s, but they were kind of still in 80s colours. Like, they're still really like... Mm. Yeah. Before kind it's of true. the red and grey and black of the 90s came in. And sometimes... And still, there's just that weird yeah. in-between yeah. bit in between decades. The Stone Roses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The emergence of Stephen Hendry with his long hair. Mm, yeah. Yeah, a sign of what was to yeah. come. I'm not sure we get we do we get decades still like in I terms don't of know. I think we, we I think just mushed the, into a yeah. continuous change rather I don't than, think there's been one there hasn't been one since uh the 90s has there I think not it's really. partly cuz the big events in the world annoyingly don't always like usefully end up falling on the actual end of the decade do they it's like things like Brexit or whatever oh, you say that but I remember no. mil- the millennium yeah. celebrations doing that <laughs> That is true. That was quite that is almost true. exactly. That was quite a yeah. big one, though. Like <laughs> to the second, the nineties, didn't they? <laughs> yeah. And there yeah. hasn't. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. right. That is the exception, Tom. There right. hasn't okay. been a decade since, <laughs> has there? So, yeah. Do you know what? It's funny. To, like I, I'd forgotten about this. One when we were talking to Tim, I had an idea for a spy thriller set in 1966 because it's all that Cold War sort of stuff. Like, think about Russian. Someone must have done this. Mm. If you think about Russians in unusual places, what about... A linesman. Yes. What about a spy thriller <laughs> wrapped around the Russian linesman who gave the goal against Germany? There's got... I, there's, someone's got to have done Ooh, something nice. like that, surely. Like a Cold War time-travelling thing where if that guy gives the goal a sliding doors <laughs> thing, you know, if Football. it goes one way this, it goes the other way that. Well, oh. yeah. Hey, oh, it's, got, it's even got a good name would already. You, you, they think it's all over, but it's only just begun. <laughs> That's the strapline, Dave. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's right God. in itself in my head. <laughs> um, Anyway, that's uh, that's the you you heard it here first, folks. The Russian linesman. Nice. That's the end of that interview. But what else have we got coming up soon, lads? I think we've got more in the pipeline. We certainly do. Andy Stanton next Is week. Andy next yep. week. Yeah, get in. Yeah, we'll all. We'll all be around for that, won't we? We'll make sure we're all present yeah. and correct for that. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It should be fine. Cool. Definitely. Won't be embarrassing with it with John hero worshiping him and stuff. That'll be yeah, fine. Yeah. No, it'll be fine. Yeah. I'm sure it won't get uh, it won't get weird mm. at any point, will it? Sure. I don't think so. Lads, there's still there's still no. been no take up on my little feature. What the book? I know. I know. It's hard, it is. isn't it? So, so if you've written a book, yeah. if you want some free advertising, assuming that you want people to buy it. Then email as a voice memo, pictures your book, 
to failingwriterspodcast at gmail.com. Just remember, it has to be exactly 30 seconds just to make it a bit more fun. And uh, and who knows? We yeah. might even buy it. We might even buy it. We might even read it. We might even talk about it on the podcast. I mean, you literally, you have nothing yeah. to lose. It's free. So just please give it a go. Or who the, doesn't want well, free exactly. Or the, the feature will it'll just disappear, won't it, into the mists of time. Like yep. so many other of my ideas. <laughs> so, you know, it would be nice for me. Send us your pitch. Give John this one thing, please. <laughs> Um, but yeah, until next week, we should probably just say au revoir or toodaloo. Tatty or bye. Whatever, whatever the Russian is for goodbye. <laughs> that's the one. That's, that's, that's not, I don't, I'm sorry if I've said something really yeah. rude in Russian. That's, yeah, that's probably, probably inappropriate. I'll just say goodbye. When you finger over the cover, you might give it a little bit of a sniff. Fingering over um, the cover, giving it a sniff. <laughs> oh, hold on a minute. Getting a little bit hot in here, or is it just... <laughs> Hello. Hello. Where's everybody gone?